Hello everybody. What connects a Ferrari F12, a luxury speedboat and a Spitfire? You're not silly, you've read the title, you already know, it's the fact they all feature a V12 engine, the undisputed god king of internal combustion power plants. This is a format that has never been all that common or all that popular, and yet still it is one surrounded by mysticism, wonder and intrigue. But, as with every other internal combustion engine, the V12, mighty though it may be, has found itself staring down the barrel of extinction, all in the name of our bold and bright new future. So, I figured this would be the perfect time to give our wonderful and rather mysterious friend a fitting send-off. This then is to be a petrol head eulogy for possibly the most special engine of them all. Enjoy. <laughs> The logic behind a V12 is actually fairly simple. You see, a straight six engine is inherently balanced in both primary and secondary terms, meaning it doesn't require any form of counterweight to make it naturally smooth. This is one of the reasons that many manufacturers, including the likes of Mercedes-Benz and BMW, have been quite so attached to it over the years. In fact, even Mazda recently have been building a straight six diesel, and that likely is one of the many reasons. A V12 then is essentially two of those, and in fact, over the years we've seen a number of examples where manufacturers have created V12 engines by essentially welding together two straight sixes. The mighty McLaren F1 power plant, as built by BMW, is mechanically very similar to that in an M3 of the time. It just happens to be two of them in one. But this you probably already knew. What you might not have was the fact that the car was in fact one of the last recipients of a V12 engine. To explain more, allow me to hand you over to VoiceOver JM for a brief history lesson. The very first V12 actually came from London's Putney Motor Works in 1904. It was called the Craig Duerwald, after one of the company's founders, and was based on a two-cylinder V design. It had a bank angle of 90 degrees and displaced 18.4 litres, weighing 430 kilos. Its purpose? To go in a racing boat. Sadly, little else seems to be known about it, but it was soon followed by other large displacement 12-cylinder engines in marine applications. Five years after that first V12, Renault then built one for use in the fledgling aircraft industry. It was a 12.2-litre unit with the more conventional 60-degree bank angle, weighing 350 kilos and making 138 horsepower at 1800 rpm. It drove the propeller from one of its camshafts. Soon after, other companies began to adopt it, with Britain, France and Austria all producing their own variants. The outbreak of war in 1914, as it always does, furthered development of the configuration and, come the end of the conflict, the V12 was one of the go-to engines for aircraft. Post-war, it even made its way into airships, and the first transatlantic flight, albeit still with stops, was performed in a Curtis NC4 flying boat, powered by a quartet of Liberty L12 engines. At this time, aviation and motoring were closely linked, so it's no surprise it didn't take long for somebody to put a V12 in a car. The chief engineer of Sunbeam Motor Cars built a custom racer in 1913, named Toodles 5 after his wife, and it featured a 9-litre V12 with 200 horsepower, an engine essentially designed to go in an aircraft, but in 1915 we did see the first production cars with a V12 arrive. The Packard Twin 6 is one of the earliest examples, along with the National V12 and the Weedley Pathfinder, all built in the USA. Europe soon followed suit, and surprisingly, the earliest example I could actually find was built by Fiat. I bet you didn't expect that. It was the 520 Super Fiat, then followed by the Daimler 66, Hispano Suiza J12, Horch 12, Maybach Zeppelin, Tatra 80, and the third Rolls-Royce Phantom. Not willing to be outdone, the Americans also went all-in on the 12, with Auburn, Cadillac, Franklin, Lincoln, Packard and Pierce Arrows all having one in the lineup. At the time, not only was the lure of a 12 a statement of luxury, eclipsing the 8, which was already becoming more commonplace there, it also had practical benefits. Being naturally smooth, it gave an appreciably improved experience to the early automobiles, which were all relatively unrefined. Large capacity also meant they could develop good power in spite of the fuel of the day being lower grade. 
But unfortunately, this golden period of automotive experimentation was to be short-lived, as in the late 20s and 1930s, America saw the arrival of the Great Depression and its effects, and then at the end of the 1930s, the world went to war once again. And though the war certainly dampened appetites for civilian vehicles with a 12-cylinder engine, for the military, the opposite was true. It was here that the V-12 engine reached its peak in the world of aviation, with Russia, Germany, America and Britain all having aircraft with a V-12. The Mikulin went in the Russian IL-2 Sturmovik and its derivatives. In Germany, Daimler-Benz V-12s powered Messerschmitts, Heinkels and Fokker Wolfs. Junkers also had their own in a range of craft, including the feared Stucker dive bomber. America and Britain largely used versions of the fabled Rolls-Royce Merlin and Griffin. These saw service in everything from the P-51 Mustang to the incredible trio that is the Lancaster Bomber, Hawker Hurricane and of course the iconic Spitfire, a set of aircraft which between them hold a very special place in the heart of Britons. <laughs> Not willing to let planes have all the fun, tanks, now vastly more effective than they had been two decades earlier, were also seeing the fitment of 12-cylinder engines. Germany's Panzer and Tiger tanks both used them at various points, as did the Soviet T-34, the American Patton, and the British Cromwell, Comet and Centurion. Even the Challenger II, which is currently still in active service, makes use of a 26.6-litre Perkins diesel V12, with over 1,200 horsepower and 4,000 newton meters of torque. Though the conflict officially ended in 1945, it was still a good number of years after that before the world returned to anything resembling normality, where luxurious products could once again be built and bought. Sadly, the Americans had already rather fallen out of love with the V-12, or more accurately, I think they'd fallen in love with the V-8. And so, it was in 1948 that the final American V-12 was constructed. And to me, the relative rarity of the V-12 in of itself does make it a very, very special thing. Somebody says they've got a V-12 and it doesn't really matter what it is, but your ears prick up, you are suddenly interested, you want to find out a little bit more. But though it's a crying shame American manufacturers abandoned the format all that time ago, you must at least give them credit for having tried. To date, Japan has only ever built one road-going V12, the Toyota GZ, as seen in the second-generation century produced about 20 years ago. Never before and never since has a Japanese car received a V12 engine. Full stop. Honda have never even made a road-going V8, let alone a 10 or 12. And this is in spite of the fact they are the only manufacturer to have ever won Formula One with a V12 engine, powering the McLaren MP4-6 back in 1991. I did have to fact check this because Wikipedia stated that that was the only time that the Formula One championship has been won by a V12 powered car. And I figured that couldn't possibly be right. Well, if you believe it is or isn't, depends on one thing, and that's this. Do you consider a flat 12 to be a V? Mechanically speaking, they are. They are a 180 degree V, being distinctly different from a boxer on account of the crank pin configuration. The difference, in case you're wondering, is that in basic terms, in a flat V engine, a 180 degree engine, the two pistons will be doing that. But in a boxer, they appear to be coming together. 
a simple but key distinction. And as we've now mentioned them, let's talk a little bit more about Ferrari. Because where certainly many manufacturers have never ever built a V12, companies like Ferrari have always been associated with it. They consider it a core part of the business. In fact, many years ago, when it came to producing a V6 engine, Enzo did not want it to wear the Ferrari badge. Hence, we got the Dino. I have been lucky enough now to sample a number of Ferrari V12s and I even own two examples, the F12 and the 550, each with a different generation of Ferrari 12 cylinder. But on top of that, I've also had the opportunity to sample a classic Ferrari V12 in the form of the old 330, and that was magnificent. Even by today's standards, it's a fantastic engine, so smooth, so responsive, and it has all of the fine qualities of a V12. And as I've been blathering on for quite a bit now, let's talk to you about some of the reasons why you would want a 12-cylinder car. First and foremost, it's a smooth engine. As we began by saying, it is inherently balanced because it is fundamentally two six-cylinders. They also tend to be a relatively large engine, though this isn't always the case. For example, the famous Ferrari 250, that was just a three litre. 250 denoting the capacity of each individual cylinder. The new Gordon Murray GMA T50, that I think is a four litre, inspired by the old Ferrari engines. And the reasoning behind that is they wanted it to be able to rev, which in a larger engine is more difficult to do. A properly set up, more sporting V12, like those you find in a modern day Ferrari, such as the F12 or 812, will also give you the characteristics of many other engines. For example, you'll have that low down pull and torque of a nice big barrel chested V8, but it'll also rev like a four cylinder Japanese sports car. They are the most wonderful of things, and because many of them are naturally aspirated, you also get the fantastic throttle response you expect of anything else that doesn't have turbos bolted to the side of it. Unlike this, and I suppose I should dedicate a few minutes at the very least to talking about the car that I'm driving today. This is a 2007 Mercedes CL600, very similar to the CL65 that I drove only about a week ago. And for both of those cars, one of the things that appealed to the owner was the engine. The 65 has one of the mightiest of them all, a six litre twin turbocharged unit producing over 600 horsepower and a frankly unbelievable Unbelievable 738 pound foot of torque. That's a nice round 1000 newton meters. And it's only that little because that is the limit of what the gearbox will take. Here, it's a five and a half litre version of near enough the same engine, and it makes a slightly lesser 510 horsepower. Torque still fairly prodigious though, 612 pound foot, that's about 830 newton meters. Both of them share the same very old-fashioned five-speed Mercedes gearbox. It was, in fact, this engine that kept the five-speed gearbox in service for quite so long. Here in the CL, it was used up until 2014 when the car was discontinued. Most other models by then were already using a seven-speed, but the simple fact was the V12s made so much torque there was no other alternative. <laughs> I mean, the CL65 was like warp speed quick, but this is not slow. The car may weigh two tons, but nobody's told the engine that. It just doesn't care. It takes a moment to wind up and the gearbox can be a little bit frustrating because it is slightly dim-witted and slow. But honestly, once it gathers its breath, you are fired towards the horizon. And this is a car that suits the V12 absolutely perfectly. You see, the CL is the pinnacle of the Mercedes-Benz lineup, certainly from a luxury perspective. They made sportier cars, they made faster cars, but in terms of the ultimate desirability, their statement car, this was it. 
Mechanically, it is essentially an S-Class Coupe, and later generations were just called the S-Class Coupe. However, it was more expensive, and therefore they threw more leather, more luxury, more tech, more features at it, and this is an absolutely amazing place to spend your time. Even the Bentley Continental GT of the time, which in some ways does feel a little more bespoke, the interior perhaps a, a touch more special, just cannot compete with this in terms of ride comfort and just overall serenity. The Bentley is attempting to be a sports car and doesn't quite succeed. This doesn't pretend to be a sports car and therefore when you go around a bend and it sticks, it positively surprises you. The AMG of course you expect to have a bit of sporting ability but the regular CL600 you just, you don't. And yet, it's a lovely thing to pilot this. Mercedes allegedly only developed a V12 in response to the fact that BMW were doing the same. In the 1970s, after a period of relative calm, we saw a resurgence in the format. A V8 for a very long time was considered the top dog, but eventually consumers began to demand a little bit more. Over in America, a V8 has always been a very ordinary engine. There's nothing particularly special about it. And though they're certainly attached to it, if you want to stand out, you need a bit more. A V10 is a tricky little so-and-so, and that's one reason why in road car terms it has been a relative rarity. But a V12 is a little easier to manage. The tricky bit, of course, is packaging. The V12 naturally is just as long as a six-cylinder, but a little wider. For makers who had only been using a V8 as their top model car, there simply wasn't the room to put in a 12. So, in certain cases, quite a bit of re-engineering had to be done but do it they did. And so from the 1970s to the 1990s, the V12 saw a resurgence in popularity, beginning with the likes of the Jaguar 5.3 litre V12, a fabulous engine and one that I think is criminally underrated. And that's an engine which is loved by those who know it, but generally avoided by everyone else, which is a shame because it's fantastic. Ruined really by its reputation for extraordinary thirst, even by the standards of the 1970s and 80s. It's notoriously untidy looking engine bay, which promises a car that's going to be near impossible to work on yourself. And the fact that allegedly you did have to work on it quite a bit because they weren't always the most durable. But the biggest tragedy for me is the fact that these engines were almost exclusively attached to three-speed automatic gearboxes. And they robbed it of the character that it was bristling with. A great shame indeed. Then later, BMW did build their 12-cylinder, as did Mercedes in response. Both fantastic power plants and, of course, one of the things about a V12 that makes it, to me, so special is the fact that because it is a difficult and expensive thing to build, manufacturers only tended to put it in cars that were worthy. So, you were never going to get a 3-series V12. You were never going to get a C-Class V12. In fact, you never got a 5 or E-Class V12. Instead, it was reserved for the 7-series, the S-Class, the CL. Every car that got a V12 is in some way, shape or form special. And so when you go shopping, even if you're looking now at a relative bargain, you'll find the one with the V12 in probably has the higher spec. Manufacturers were desperate to try and convince people to buy one, and it didn't really work all that often. For example, the BMW 7 Series that I had, the 760, over seven years they sold in the UK just 200 of them a tiny, tiny proportion of sales, but every single one of them stands out because the interior is different to all of the other models. The standard specification is different to all of the other models. And of course, it goes differently and goes better than all of the other models. The CL is an excellent demonstration of this because where in other models, the 600 would be the top dog barring an AMG. Here, I think it was actually only the second from the bottom. You have the CL500, then the 600, then a variety of different AMGs, performance packs, and the like. 
This car actually makes about 40 horsepower less than the CL63, but a little bit more torque. Even Ford indirectly got in on the action in the form of Aston Martin, who they owned in the 1990s. Deciding that an old Jaguar straight six wasn't quite good enough, they built a brand new engine which powered all of their cars from the DB7 Vantage up to the second generation Vanquish. Today, the Aston Martin V12 still lives on in 5.2 litre twin turbo form, and it is, as ever, a mighty engine. And I can't even believe I've got this far without mentioning Lamborghini, one of the true guardians of the V12. I'm fortunate enough to have experienced many of them in the form of the Countach, the Diablo, the Murcielago and the Aventador. Each and every one a fabulous car, but the highlight, the engine. Even in the Aventador where low down it doesn't really seem to have all that much torque, once you get it on song it is wonderful and if you do want your car to make a genuine formula one noise for me there's only one starting point a v12 f spot proved that even a humble s class from 30 years ago can be made to sound incredible with the right pipes on it put in a second And I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that have bought cars like that and this who've done so because it's the same engine as a Zonda, don't you know? It's not quite. Very close though. As a card carrying petrol head, I like to think I've got an element of appreciation for just about every kind of engine out there, from the lowliest two-stroke 50cc up to the mighty V12 itself. But I think in years to come, it's going to be the 12 that we look back on with the greatest of fondness. Though it's certainly a flawed beast, it drinks fuel whether you want it to or not. It's difficult to package, it's difficult to place, and from a sporting perspective, it can also have undesirable effects in terms of the car's balance and handling. But done even vaguely right, a V12 doesn't ruin a car, it makes it. And as the rarest, most special, most expensive and most desirable of all, I think this is something that we're really, really going to miss. Because let's face it, when we have electric cars, it doesn't matter whether they've got 100, 500, 1,000, 3,000 horsepower. The delivery is going to be kind of the same. The noise is going to be kind of the same. The feel is going to be essentially the same. Engines have character. And though some may consider this the Oliver Reed of engines, you might not like it, but you're also never, ever going to forget it. I know I certainly won't. Goodbye, V12. I'll miss you most of all. And to exit, I think, a little montage of some of the amazing 12s I've been able to experience over the past few years. A huge thanks to everybody for watching, and of course, to Chris for bringing this car out. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.